Hi, and welcome back. In this uh, video, which is part of our, our discussion of statistical models, uh, we're going to focus on the concepts underlying linear models, which are ones where our response is some additive combination of terms from different predictors. Uh, sometimes those predictors can be categorical var variables, such as a control or a treatment, uh, in which case a linear model uh, is an ANOVA. Uh, sometimes your predict predictors might be continuous variables, such as some continuous X predicting some continuous Y, in which case our linear model is a regression. Uh, sometimes it might be a mix of categorical variables and uh, continuous variables. Um, and indeed, uh, almost everything that you were taught in, in intro stats about different, what, what are called our different statistical models really are just the same statistical model, linear models. Um, I personally have never really understood why we teach different names for different things that are really the same model. So, you know, you, there, you, know, you may have learned about an ANOVA versus learned about a regression and then taught them as if they were two different things, but they really are the same model under the hood. Um, and there's no really, no distinction. And so within R, when we learn about how to implement these models, we're gonna implement all of these different sorts of things that often go by different names, just using one, uh, one, uh, one function for fitting linear models. Okay, so I wanna talk about, uh, over the course of these next videos, uh, the basic steps of of model fitting and model analysis, and, and also touching on how to do them in R. I'm gonna particularly focus on linear models, but a lot of what I'm talking about generalizes uh, to any statistical modeling. So first is hypothesis generation, and this is really important. I, mean, I can't emphasize how important this is. Um, if you just go into data and just start fitting models without actually questions, you know, you could, you know, first of all, you know, you know, what are you doing? You're not really answering questions if you're not asking questions. Uh, and two, um, it can be very easy using these sorts of uh, approaches to overfit. And, and overfitting models is, you know, kind of when you fit a model that describes the noise in the data as much as describing the patterns in the data, usually caused by putting too many explanatory variables in. And uh, the reality is that sometimes you miss those because, miss that you've overfit uh, because you're testing too many models. And so the, the statistical tests like p-value and stuff like that are, are actually designed around you know, testing a single model. And if you're doing multiple tests with multiple models, you're inflating your, your rate of false positives. Uh, so the, the, the probability of, of kind of, uh, getting a significant result when there actually isn't anything going on. And so, you know, the more tests you do, the more likely you're going to find one that fits just by chance. So if, if you think about our traditional, you know, p-value of, of 0.05 or a 1 in 20 as our threshold of significance, if you fit 20 models, you know, one of them on average is going to do a good job just by chance, even if there's no relationship between x and y. Um, so the more models you fit, the more likely you are to uh, get false positives. And so by, by having clear questions ahead of time and a clear set of models we want to test predefined, you know, reduces uh, uh, our likelihood of getting these false positives because it allows us to focus on answering questions and, and uh, usually performing a smaller number of tests. Uh, that said, hypothesis generation is often followed by some form of exploratory data analysis. And I think that is really critical, even if you have key hypotheses in mind, uh, because you need to understand whether the data you're working with uh, follows the assumptions of the statistical models that you're planning on using. You know, so for example, if, if you're planning on using linear models and you look at uh, a, a, the relationship in the data and the relationship in the data is clearly nonlinear, uh, you need to stop and reassess what you're doing and not just proceed forward to fit a linear model uh, when you know the relationship is nonlinear. Um, yeah. So after kind of uh, doing sort of these exploratory analysis, we usually then proceed on to looking at the correlations between our variables, the, our response variables, say our y's, and our predictors, our x's. And often, I, I, I would recommend that typically you start doing that 
uh, one at a time. So if I have you know four things that are hypoth that I hypothesize affect why, I'm going to look you know start by maybe looking at each of those individually, uh, so that I can understand those individual relationships uh, and 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 you know the the strengths of each of them individually. Um, that said, if I do have multiple hypothesized predictors, um, I, my goal may be to build up to uh, a more complex models that involves uh, the, the roles of multiple predictors at once. Uh, and so the next thing I would want to do is check for collinearity. And that's basically looking at the correlations among my x variables uh, to make sure that they are actually relatively independent of each other. And they're not just duplicate things. You, as I'll talk about later, you can get into uh, real trouble if you are, you know, if, if you, you know, if you, if you say you had x as a predictor of y, and if you also put into the model 2x as a predictor of y, you know, 2x will predict y, x will predict y, but if you put x and 2x into the model, you know, you're going to get gibberish back uh, as your estimates of slopes because you know, they're really telling you the exact same thing. They're not telling you different things. So once we've kind of assessed uh, the, the, the relationships among our predictor variables, uh, we can use them to build up more complex models. Uh, but then once we build up more complex models, we need some way of choosing among them. And this is usually tightly coupled to the idea of hypothesis testing. We want to choose among alternative models. And in fact, that's one important way of viewing hypothesis testing in general is a choice between alternative models. So even things like you know, the simple one I alluded to earlier, like is A different from zero? You know, that's a test, you know, comparison between a model where A is bigger than zero and a model where A is zero, and then asking which, uh, which has a higher probability of predicting the observed data. And then finally, once we've selected a model, uh, we'll want to perform various model diagnostics and, and you know, go through kind of a model evaluation period. I mean, just because we fit a model and it gives us back a good score doesn't mean that we should stop. We need to look and see how well the model actually did. Okay, so in, in using, uh, in explaining these concepts, I'm going to rely on a simple data set, which are measurements of soil temperature, uh, in this case measured at 30 centimeters depth, um, coming from a, a, a study site in Wisconsin called Willow Creek. Uh, we'll, we'll see more about this uh, site when I kind of dive into the model diagnostics lecture that comes after the linear models lecture, um, where we have a lot of different sensors actually uh, operating at Willow Creek. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at this data, and, and we can kind of already see just looking at it that you know we kind of have this nice flat uh, low temperature period in the winter, and then we have this nice seasonal cycle. You know, it warms up in the spring, it's warm in the summer, it cools down in the fall, and then it goes back to kind of a baseline uh, winter value. So what causes that variability? So, so, you know, what's actually the drivers of that seasonal cycle? You know, what causes the, the wiggles around that overall seasonal cycle? You know, how could we explain the patterns we see here? Um, and to help us explain those patterns, you know, at this site, like I said, we're measuring a bunch of things. And if we want to understand what drives soil temperature, you know, we could throw, you know, this whole list of predictor variables at uh, soil temperature. But that, I would argue, that's not really the right thing to do because there's no real plausible mechanism for why some of these things might have an effect. So, you know, if I look down at the bottom of the list, you know, I can see GPP, gross primary productivity. Why would uh, you know the the rate of photosynthesis in the canopy would that have any causal impact uh, on you know, the temperature in the soil? Like, not really. You can't really make a plausible argument for why the photosynthetic rate in the canopy would have a causal relationship uh, with the temperature in the soil, even if they correlate well. Like, they might correlate well, but because they're both being driven by some other variable, so. You know, both the GPP and soil temperature are going to show a seasonal cycle, but it's not because one is causing the other, it's because they're both being caused uh, by some other variable, such as variation in light or variation in temperature. Um, and so if you went through this, this list of, of possible predictors, you might think about, 
which ones do plausibly affect uh, soil temperature. And so in my case, I'm gonna narrow that overall list down to, to six possible explanatory variables. Uh, the incoming shortwave radiation, so that's the solar radiation coming from the sun, visible and in, in near-infrared. Uh, the incoming longwave or thermal radiation, so that's what's reflected back from the cat clouds. It's you know, the key to global warming. It's that heat coming back, reflecting back from the atmosphere. Um, soil moisture might be related to soil temperature. You can make a pretty plausible argument for why that, that might be. Uh, air temperature might be related to soil temperature. You know, warm air would make warm soil. Uh, wind speed might be, you know, if, it, if it's, you know, blowing, if, if the winds are very fast, the soils will cool off more fast. If the winds are very slow, the soils will cool off very slowly. Um, and vapor pressure deficit is one that may be less intuitive, but vapor pressure deficit is basically a measure of humidity. And it's really the measure of the difference uh, between uh, saturation Humidity, so you know, when it, when the, the humidity when something's at 100% and the humidity in the atmosphere. And, and essentially, it, it's a great variable for predicting uh, the rate of evaporation. Um, and so you, so you might think that, that vapor pressure deficit is a good predictor of soil temperature because evaporation cools the soil. And so if, if water is evaporating from the soil, uh, uh, it'll cool. And so vapor pressure deficit would, might, be, might be a predictor. Okay, cool. So I'm going to wrap up there, and then I'm going to pick up in the next lecture with, with the next step in our overall sequence, which is exploratory data analysis.